Um, I wanted to share really a story that, um, that came to me some years ago as I was speaking at a dinner in St. Louis. Um, and really the story began a couple of years before that when I, when I met my wife's grandfather for the first time. Now he was, a, he was a colonel in the Air Force, retired colonel in the Air Force, and he was quite a curmudgeon. He had never once liked anybody that my wife Michelle had brought home and she brought me to see him on a day that he was not in a good mood. <laughs> he had been a B-17 crewman in the Second World War and was shot down over what's now Poland and spent uh, five months in three different camps in Germany and then later went on to be a B-29 crewman, B-47, B-50, and B-52. And, um, and he, was, he was quite a character. And when she introduced me to him, he looked at me and he says, so, <clears throat> what kind of work do you have? Or do you even have a job? <laughs> and I said, why would I need a job? Michelle's a surgeon. <laughs> and uh, boy, the look I got from him. And, and her father just jumped in between the two of us and kind of pulled us apart. And he said, well, hold on, hold on. Mike works for Boeing. And he gave me this look. And he said, huh? And, I, and Jim, my father-in-law, says, yeah, Mike's the chief engineer of the 767. And he, he's like, whoa. Well, that's interesting. We went into a corner and started talking, and I mean, we were there for probably two hours. And the next day, he called the house uh, to talk to me and never even talked to, to my wife, Michelle. Um, and we became really good friends. And, um, you know, he, and like I say, he was a character. He was, he was very funny and uh, very humble in his own way. And the first time I went to his home, they lived in um, outside of Round, Round Rock, Texas. And his wife, Dally, brought out this box of letters he'd written home during the Second World War. And the first probably 25 letters as a return address had an airbase in England. And the 26th letter, the return address literally said Stalag 9. And when you open the, the letter, it starts out, Dear Dally, by now you've probably noticed my change of address. <laughs> and that's how she found out he was a POW. And that's the way he was. Um, Several years later, I was invited to um, do the dinner lecture at an organization called the 509th Bomb Squadron. It was the reunion of the 509th Bomb Squadron in St. Louis. And the 509th was formed up uh, around Paul Tibbetts and the B-29 in the Pacific. And these guys were, they were real characters. And I went to give the, the dinner lecture and um, they pulled me, one of the guys pulled me aside and he was describing, he was flying in the the B-29 behind the Enola Gay that carried the photography equipment and the data gathering equipment. And there were two other crewmen from that flight who I got to talk to that evening that had seen the Enola Gay in action that night. And it was interesting because these guys were so humble and in general, none of them believed that what they did then was relevant today with the exception potentially of having bombed Toulouse. They thought that was pretty cool and frankly so did I, but that's a whole other story. Um, so as we talked, I said, you know, one of the things about our industry today is our industry is built on, on what you guys did all those years ago. And in fact, we do all of our work standing on the shoulders of giants and looking into the past, seeing what they did, learning from what they did, and then turning around and looking into the future. But without the shoulders of those giants to stand on, we wouldn't make progress. And I, that, that became a recurring theme to me as I looked at all of the Boeing airplanes and I looked and I could see the DNA in airplanes from previous generations still in those airplanes today. And when I look at a 787, which I have particular pride for, when I look at that airplane, I see the DNA from 100 years of innovation in that airplane. Some of which these gentlemen in that 509th Bomb Squadron Union had a lot to do with. And so I started thinking about our, our history and I, thinking about the DNA of our airplanes and where it all started and starting to kind of trace my family tree um, through airplanes back to the very beginning. And I found out that we, have, we had a cousin here in Australia as I chased my family tree back. And we can talk about that tonight a little bit too. I was there for the 75th anniversary and I remember thinking, wow, what an what a amazing thing that was and what will it be like on the 100th and will we still be around? And it's, um, it's, it's just really incredible. Now, I don't have to say much about um, Sir Charles Kingsford Smith, but it's, it's really an incredible story. And certainly the Charles Lindbergh of this part of the world 
And when I think about what Charles Lindbergh did when he flew across the Atlantic, and um, Charles and his team did that like many times in a row getting across the Pacific from Oakland to Hawaii, to Fiji, to New Zealand, to Australia. And what's so amazing about that is I did that this morning and nobody noticed. I mean, there might have been one or two people here who are glad I showed up, but in general, nobody noticed. But, but isn't that what greatness is all about? To do something that nobody had ever imagined could be done and to do it in a way that enabled it to happen again and again and again. And now hundreds or thousands of people do it every day and nobody notices. That's the impact that, that men like this have had on our world, that people like this have had on our world. And, it, and it's really amazing. I go back and I look at the long history of aerospace that followed in Australia and it's really incredible, a tremendously rich aviation history that has inextricably tied Boeing and our heritage companies, Douglas Aircraft, McDonnell Aircraft, North American Aviation, that have tied us inextricably to Australia's history. In 1927, with the formation of de Havilland of Australia, in 1936, with the formation of the Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation, which later went on to become part of Boeing and to build many, many airplanes here. In 1937, with the um, government aircraft factories that eventually became Aerospace Technologies of Australia. A amazing history, 1961, um, De Hawker, De Havilland becoming um, Hawker De Havilland of Australia, which it then, in 1986, acquired the Commercial Aircraft Corporation. And you think about all of these things acquired by Boeing then in 2000, with a name change to Boeing Aerostructures of Australia in 2009. This is a deep history that goes back very, very far. And it's not just history, it's the present day as well. I think of the airplanes that were built here collaboratively with the Australians and some of our heritage companies. The North American 16, which eventually 755 of those were built here in Australia at the CAC. The, the P-51, 199 of them were built here. The F-86, 112 of which were built here. And the F-18, 73 of which were built here. A tremendous history that goes way back. But like I said, it's not just history. There's over 3,200 employees, Boeing employees, here in Australia today. It's our largest presence anywhere in the world outside of the United States. And Australians doing amazing things for Boeing in the aerospace industry. My own pride and joy, the 787 is an airplane that would not exist, if it, and certainly not in the way it does today, if it weren't for the team here working on that airplane doing wonderful work delivering parts to that airplane. And it, it's just an incredible business and incredible industry. And so I think back to those early days and I think about what, what our, early, our earliest predecessors did in the airplanes that they designed. This is the, the model um, 247. And this airplane, you know, back in the 1930s was an amazing technical achievement for its time. And while there were about 75 of these airplanes designed and delivered, designed, built, and delivered. It was an amazing technical achievement for its day. And I start, there, there were many airplanes that preceded this one, but I start with this one because the DNA of every Boeing jet transport today is in this airplane. And I can give you just some simple examples. This was the first airplane that was ever designed with all metal, semi-monocoque structure, partially retractable landing gear, it was the first airplane with an autopilot. It was the first airplane with a de-icing system. Uh, it was a number of firsts. And, and in fact, if you look at this, this picture, you can see the cockpit window is slanted forward from the bottom up. And the reason it's slanted that way was so that the instrument panel lights didn't reflect off the, the cockpit glass. Well, they got together a little while later and figured out that if they put a glare shield over those instruments, they could, they could um, block the light from the instruments from the cockpit windows, and they were able to redesign those windows so they, they angled inward, which saved a lot of structure and saved a bunch of weight. And that was the first glare shield, shield that was ever installed in an airplane, and all of our airplanes today have those glare shields on them. What also is interesting to me about this airplane is that it flew cross-country in 19 and a half hours. It set a record in 19 and a half hours and won the Collier Trophy in 1934. So a lot of firsts, but those firsts are now regular occurrences on all of our airplanes today. And nobody really thinks that it goes back that far, but it does. And then came the Model 307 Stratoliner. Now, 
I didn't talk about the military airplanes that came between, but this airplane exists only because of the B-17 that my wife's grandfather flew. This airplane was built on a B-17 wing, on a B-17 tail, B-17 landing gear, and a B-17 rudder. In fact, all of those components of this airplane came from the production B-17C model. Now on top of that, they put a circular fuselage and they pressurized it. So this became the first pressurized commercial airplane. And so the, it had a service ceiling of above 20,000 feet. You could fly on the airplane comfortably um, at a pressure altitude that was something that we could survive at. But that was done in this airplane. And again, you know, one of the first, and that was eventually carried forward in every airplane. Now, only 10 of them were built because the war came along and the, our defense department um, took all 10 of those airplanes and production was then turned to, to building 12,000 B-17s and only 10 of these were ever built. But the whole idea of the pressurized cabin really carried forward and this wasn't the first airplane or the last airplane to start with a kind of a military heritage. The Model 7, 377 Stratocruiser was based heavily on the B-29 design. The B-29 design, the B-29 by the way, was the first pressurized bomber and the B-29 was morphed into a, a tanker transport airplane called the KC-97. That KC-97 took the B-29 design and essentially took the lower fuselage, the wings, the, the engines for the prototype version of the airplane had the B-29 engines, and they built a circular cross-section fuselage larger than the B-29 above that, and something like 888 of those were built in the, in the military configuration. But later, a double bubble fuselage was added to that, and that became the, um, the Model 377 Stratocruiser. And that double bubble fuselage carried forward and was very similar to what we had on the, on the 747, actually. So, and and the, other, the other neat thing about this airplane was that um, it was the first commercial airplane with a yaw damper, the first Boeing airplane with a yaw damper for ride quality. And it also used vortex generators for controlling se the separation of flow off various surfaces on the airplane. Again, another first. And so while the people were working on these designs, there were, there were other folks that were in you know, quiet back rooms trying to figure out how to meet the requirements of our Air Force for a long-range bomber. And, and it was really interesting because they believed that jet technology was the right step to make this was in 1944, before the end of the war. Um, they believed that jet technology was the right step to take. And they had a straight winged design with jets and that was the proposal that we were gonna go forward with. Before the end of the Second World War, George Shire, who was our chief aerodynamicist, was following allied troops into, into the invasion of Germany. And they came across some German wind tunnels and in those wind tunnels, they found the data that indicated that a swept wing design was more efficient for high-speed subsonic flight. And George contacted the team back in Seattle and they changed the design of the B-47 from a straight-winged bomber to a swept-winged bomber. And the cross-section and the wing plan form and the tail plan form and the wing-mounted engines that we know today were born on that B-47. Really, really amazing when you think about it. And, and this airplane was very similar in size to the 737 today, 116 foot wingspan, just like the 737 today. But what to me is most amazing is that this airplane flew 44 years after the Wright brothers' first flight. Can you imagine, 44 years from the Wright flyer to a swept wing, six engine jet, long distance jet bomber. Imagine the pace of change and the pace of innovation over the course of that 44 years. It, it's truly amazing. And again, this design was built on all of the previous designs, all adding up to, to a more efficient, safer design. And, and they never stopped, they just kept going. Before this airplane flew, before it flew, the Air Force came back to Boeing and was interested in an even longer range bomber, a, a bomber that wouldn't have to stop and make refueling stops at any foreign nations that would be able to fly from U.S. soil to where the threat was anywhere in the world. And they submitted a bid, and Boeing won the bid for the B-52. 70 years ago this year. Isn't that amazing? 
The B-52 contract was won by Boeing 70 years ago this year, 1946. And, and we went to work on that configuration as well. This is, this is how it turned out, but it certainly didn't start that way. And the story of the B-52 is really in many ways the story of every Boeing airplane because it went through so many different gyrations, many of which nobody ever even saw, thrown away by the design teams because they didn't work for one reason or another. I, I picked just a couple of them, the model 462, the 464, and the 464-35, uh, just as three examples. It started out as a relatively straight-winged six-engine prop plane, mm -hmm. then it became a delta-wing four-engine prop plane, and then a slightly swept-wing four-engine prop plane. And it wasn't an easy decision for the Air Force to decide to go with jets or props, because remember, the B-47 hadn't flown yet, so it was still unproven. And while, while 2032 B-47s eventually flew, the B-52 was a tough decision. And when we went to get the final design approved, it was in um, Dayton, Ohio, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base on a Friday. And on that day, we took a design to the Air Force. It was a, a, a prop design, and the Air Force said, it's not good enough. You gotta make it better. And the guys went back to the hotel that night, and there were only five of them. They went back to the hotel room that night, and they put their heads together to try to draw up a jet version, a jet engine version of that bomber. And what, what you see here is a sketch of the balsa wood model that they were going to build to bring back to the Air Force on Sunday. And so they went back to the hotel room. They did a lot of hand calculations. They drew up a design of an airplane that um, became the B-52 over the course of a weekend. They built a balsa wood model and they took it to the Air Force at the end of the weekend. And that airplane over the course of a weekend became the B-52 that we know today, 744 of which were built and 80 of which are still flying today. 80 are still flying today. And it is believed that the airplane will still be flying in 2040, which is just amazing when you think of from contract award through the end of its operational life, a hundred year span. That's what we do in this industry. We do things that last a long time and matter to a lot of people. And, that, and, and again, it's, it's giants like these whose shoulders we get on and we look into the past and we learn their lessons. And then we look to the future to figure out what we can do next. I listed a couple of the, of the specs for the B-52 just because I think it's so interesting in a lot of ways. So cruise speed, 442 knots service ceiling 50,000 feet, ferry range 8,000 miles, wingspan 185 feet, 488,000 pound maximum takeoff weight. Those numbers are very similar to the 787. I mean, they're off by 10, 15% in either direction, but very, very similar to the 787. And to do that mission, it burned about five times the gas with eight engines. I mean, eight engines, wow. I had an engine out one time, in a, in a Cessna 150, that's one engine. <laughs> I've always looked at that airplane longingly ever since that day. <laughs> so it was those designs that became the, the prototype for the 707, and it's no accident. I mean, we, we took what we learned on the B-47 and what, what our, our men and women did in service with the B-47 really proved to the world that wing-mounted, swept wing jet aircraft could be as safe and as reliable as any other aircraft flying. And that was, that was a tough thing to prove, but they did it through operational use. Now the B-47, it had a hard time getting started. Like anytime, anytime you push technology, anytime you, you push technology in many different areas at the same time, it's hard and things go wrong and you figure out how to pick up and recover from it. And those teams did on the B-47. But what they showed the world, the industry and themselves, was that a swept wing jet aircraft could be as reliable and as safe as any other type of airplane in the world. And that's what gave Boeing the confidence to do the 707 at a time when the competition, at least in the United States, was going turboprop. And this was a tough decision. This was a bet the company decision that was made. Now the, it's, it, it looks a lot like the 707 did. Um, this prototype though was substantially narrower than the, seven, the 707. It had a, 
uh, fuselage cross-section that was 12 inches smaller than the KC-135, which was four inches smaller than the 707. So eventually, this cross-section was grown by 16 inches to become the 707. But, but it was a real battle to get people to believe in the airplane and to believe that it could, be, that it could really be done. And, um, and we did, clearly. 707 became a great airplane. It really became the mainstay of the jet transport fleet. We learned a lot from building that airplane. Uh, and there's a picture of Qantas's first 707, the original of which was returned here just 10 years ago. Beautiful airplane. And of course, they named a wine after it. I don't know if we've got any Penfolds fans here, but you know, Bin 707 was named after the, the Boeing 707. I don't, just wanted to throw that in here. So if anybody's got any 707 they want to pour tonight, my glass is right over there. Be, that'd be great. So then we did the 727, and the, the whole idea of the 727 was to try to lower the cost of the 707 by going to fewer engines. Having three was important because we wanted to use the airplane from North America to the Caribbean, and flying over water, it was believed at the time, took three engines, took more than two engines. And so, so we created the 727. And that airplane obviously became, became, became uh, quite a success. That led to the 737, which eventually became the most successful commercial um, jet ever. But that was a, it was a tough slog to get to the 737. The idea was to try to create a less expensive version of the 727 that didn't go quite as far and allow, was able to be used with a smaller number of people over shorter distances. The original design for the 737 had 60 passengers. And in negotiations with Lufthansa, who bought the first 21 of those airplanes, we increased the passenger count to 100. So the airplane had 100 passengers with a design target range of day in, day out missions between 500 and 1,000 miles. That was the original plan for the 737. That was the original 737-100. Just two months later, United came and asked for a stretched version of the 737, and we created the 737-200, which stretched the airplane by, I think, 12 feet and added um, about 20 passengers to the airplane, 18 or so passengers to the airplane. So it started growing. Now, it was really tough, tough days in the early days of the 737 program. In fact, in 1970, there were only 31 new orders for the airplane in 1970 and the company considered ending production of the 737 or selling it overseas, selling the whole program overseas because it didn't appear as if there would be a future for the airplane. We're pretty glad today that we didn't do that. We're um, over 9,000 airplanes in and we've got a order book for close to 5,000 airplanes. So we're glad that, it, that we didn't do that, but it's, it's turned into a great airplane. And you know that original 100 passengers up to um, you know, uh, 1,000 nautical miles. The airplane as it stands today can seat up to 220 at the door limit and can go 4,000 nautical miles depending on the configuration. So it's been quite a dramatic improvement to the airplane over the years. And this is a really good example of the other things that we've learned from the people that, that, that created our company. And that is that, or created this industry, I should say, the giants that came before us. And that is that you always improve the project product. You never leave it alone. The 737 has reduced fuel burn by 1.3% every year for the 40 years that it's been in existence. Every year, the airplane gets better and better and better. That's what our business is all about. Now, um, Qantas has 75 737-800s, and I was, able, I was actually able to be at the delivery ceremony of the 75th airplane, and that was really quite a thrill to see number 75 go out. And it's funny because you, you remember the day that the deal is done and you remember the announcement that somebody's gonna buy the airplane and you think, my God, 75 airplanes, wow. How are we ever gonna do that? And then it just goes, it goes so fast. Um, and it's so exciting to see. Now, um, I had the privilege of speaking at a Royal Aeronautical Society dinner in Seattle, the Joe Sutter dinner. And the, the tough part about that was Joe was sitting next to me at dinner. And he kept telling me, no, don't screw up, don't screw up. <laughs> and Joe tells you that, and he means it. So Sir Charles wasn't with me today, so I, I, I'm trying not to screw up. But Joe was, Joe can be pretty intimidating. And you know, Joe, we just lost Joe this year. He was 95 years old. And Joe still, 
as recently as two months ago, was making substantial contributions to the design of our airplanes. I would meet with Joe probably every two months, and he would look at the product development portfolio, and he'd tell us where we were right, and he'd tell us where we were wrong, and if he thought strongly enough about how wrong we, we were, we were, he'd call up Ray Connor and tell Ray how wrong we were. And so, uh, and so it was always, it was always a, a real thrill to work with Joe. And I remember in the middle of the 787 program, um, when it was really, really tough, I remember walking in to a dinner and Joe looked at me and he said, God, you look terrible. You feeling okay? I said, Joe, don't worry about me. <laughs> I'll be okay. But uh, Joe always asked how you were doing. He was always concerned about the people on the team. And uh, it, it was a real, it's a real thrill to work with Joe. And Joe, of course, was the father of the 747. The 747 was another one of those bet the company projects that um, was really difficult to believe that people had the courage to launch off and do an airplane like that airplane, but it certainly was an airplane that changed the world. And I know that there are, there are many um, technically advanced airplanes like the Concorde that was a marvel. It was a marvel. And I remember the day that the last Concords, they, they flew their last commercial flights um, I was in, in London on top of the Boeing building at Cardinal Point right next to Heathrow. And there were um, three Concords lined up on final all at the same time, one right behind the other. One had come over from the States uh, and two had gone out and flying a, just tourists around the North Sea. They went out and went supersonic and then came back in. And that night we were sitting in a pub and there was a, a survey on TV on the BBC. And they asked the question, they're asking people on the street, which airplane had the biggest impact on aviation? The Concorde, the 747, and I don't even remember what the third one was. Everybody thought the Concorde did. There were 13 of them in service. A tiny fraction of the world ever got to fly on a, on a Concorde. But the 747 changed the world because it allowed people to come here all the time. It allowed people to fly, normal people, to fly to Europe from North America without paying what would be the equivalent of tens of thousands of dollars today. It was an airplane that democratized air travel and allowed us to go see the world. And I've said this many times, my personal mission statement is to safely and efficiently bridge cultures and bring people together. And that's what we do at Boeing. We bridge cultures and we bring people together. And the 747 is the epitome of that because that airplane allowed cultures to join together safely and efficiently in ways that they never had before. Just, just a tremendous, tremendous story. And, and as I said, we never let it get old. We kept improving it. The 747-400 was a tremendous improvement over the 300, which was an improvement over the 200 and the 100. And now the 747-8 is out flying today at, in both the freighter and the intercontinental version. I love this picture because this is my buddy Mike Carricker in the right seat of the first 787. And we're taking a picture of the first 747 intercontinental out of the window of the first 787 with a North American T-38 chase plane in the background. So kind of different layers of Boeing history all stacked up. Um, really, really fun. Now, then came the 757. And now the 757 was, was special because it was supposed to replace the 727. But as the configuration came together, it became apparent that the airplane had significantly more capability than the 727 had. The, the 757 was a remarkably capable airplane, and it was supposed to be common with the, the 727, and in fact, almost none of it was common with the 727. I met with our former chairman, Phil Condit, a couple of months ago, and we were talking about the 5767 development program, and he said, you know, Mike, one of the things, he said, I wanted to go find one bracket, just one bracket, off the 727 that I could pour it over to the 757 so we could say there was at least one common part between the two airplanes. And I don't know if he ever did, but um, this airplane became very common with the 767, which is another unique story because two completely different airplanes with two completely different missions that for the first time ever had a common type rating. So the same pilot could get trained in the 57 and with a short differences course fly the 67 be licensed to fly the 6-7 because they were considered by the FAA the same type. That was the first time and one of the very few times that that was ever done. The 5-7 is a, is a great airplane and it wasn't until probably the last 
five or ten years that airlines started figuring out how to use the great range capability of the 5.7 and you start seeing 5.7s in service across the North Atlantic from North America to Europe and just tremendous capability. This is a tough airplane, uh, tough airplane to beat but one of my jobs is to try to figure out how to beat it and so that's a lot of fun. The 767 was developed at the same time as the 757 and essentially with the same teams. You had one team developing a flight management system that went on both airplanes. You had another team developing the displays that went on both airplanes. And so the same team concurrently developed to a large degree both of these airplanes at the same time. But unlike the 5-7, the 6-7 had a much different mission. The 6-7's mission was to fragment the North Atlantic and to make bringing people closer even more of a reality than it had been with the 747. We loved the 747, but that airplane wanted to go to, from New York to London. It really wanted to go from hub to hub. It was a big airplane. It needed a lot of runway. And it wanted to go from one big airplane airport to another big airport. The 6-7 had the promise of going from smaller airport to smaller airport, but still going across the North Atlantic. And that was, that was a real trick for us to figure that out. Um, Dick Taylor, who just also recently passed, um, Dick was really the father of the, of the two-man crew. And so the thing about the 767, what this picture is, is a picture of the flight engineer station, which was installed in the first dozen 767s. And in fact, the first three airplanes were delivered with a flight engineer station on it. And for another customer, as options, we put in a flight engineer station for security reasons for that customer. But, but it was amazing because while the program was being developed with a three-man crew and the, the flight engineer station, um, we were behind the scenes trying to demonstrate that it was just as safe to fly an airplane that's designed for two crews as it is to fly with three crew. And so Dick was successful in making that happen. And we went out and retrofitted all those airplanes on the field, except for the first three where we didn't have time, retrofit all those airplanes on the field from three crew to two crew which was really amazing in, 19, in 1980. That was an amazing feat to be able to retrofit those airplanes so quickly and deliver them. The other thing that the 767 did was really extend um, twin engine operation beyond what had been um, able to be flown before. This chart demonstrates um, extended twin engine operations, ETOPS, that also stands for engines turn or people swim, if you haven't heard that before. Um, and so that says that, that to be able to fly you have to be able to fly the airplane in a way such that if an engine fails that you are within 60 minutes of a suitable airport for landing at single engine speed. So you had to be able to fly the airplane with one engine failed to an airport that's suitable for landing of that airplane. And if you're limited to 60 minutes of operation like that, it significantly limits where you can fly the airplane. And on this chart, it shows all the areas in blue are areas that can't be flown with only 60 minutes of extended operations or less. So you can see even a spot in the middle of North America by Hudson Bay has a spot that you could not overfly with 60 minutes of ETOPS. Parts of Australia, parts of Africa, parts of Asia, and certainly most of the world's oceans. The 767 under Dick Taylor again, that team put together a plan for demonstrating the reliability of modern turbofan engines in a way that using data made it clear that you could fly more than 60 minutes over water with two engines. And they were granted 120 minutes of ETOPS operation, which significantly expanded where the airplane could be used, and then the efficiency of the airplane on the North Atlantic. That 120 minute rule on the North Atlantic really opened up the corridor between Europe and North America and started fragmenting city pairs. So you could fly from St. Louis to London instead of having to fly from St. Louis to New York to London, and so on, all across Europe and across North America. And then further, they did the work to demonstrate that even more than 120 minutes of ETOPS could eventually be granted. And so it was, it was really amazing progress. And like I said, Dick, was a, was a, Dick Taylor was a, started as a B-47 test pilot um, worked for Boeing for years and years and years, but really was the father of the two crew uh, operation and also father of ETOPS for us. Now, after the 767, the real question was, what do we do next? Twin engines, airplanes looked like the right thing to do. The thrust level capability was increasing. 
And we kept asking the question about what do the airlines want? They wanted more capability than the 67. They wanted to be able to fly farther and they wanted to be able to carry more people than the 67. And so we, we, we always do this. We try to convince ourselves that we can meet the need with a derivative airplane because it's cheaper than doing it with an all new airplane. And so we, we, we searched our souls for ways to make the 767 do what the 777 eventually wanted to do. And you can see um, an artist concept there of the 757, the 767, and the 767X, which was also lovingly called the Hunchback of Muckleteo. A beautiful, beautiful airplane that unfortunately never, never flew. Um, it was in a board meeting that my predecessor, John Roundhill, had uh, with the Boeing leadership where they looked at them as they were pitching versions of the 767 derivatives. They, they finally said, well, why don't you do a new airplane? It's like, well, hey, that's a good idea. You know, I have something drawn up back in my office. Let me go get it. And that's how the 777 was born. And the 777, um, which became a, the airplane that fragmented the Pacific, the North Pacific, not just the North Atlantic, but the North Pacific, it went to 180 minutes of ETOPS out of the box, meaning that the day the airplane was certified, it could operate 180 minutes of ETOPS. Unlike the 6-7 that had to build up that capability over many years of operation. And 180 minutes out of the box became the new standard and, um, and allowed for remarkable operation of the airplane. Now, Jeff, I'm gonna give you credit. Jeff Thomas, this is his chart. But I love it because it just, it visually demonstrates what it took all these years to get from hop, 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 to get from London to Australia to where you can do it in 19 and a half hours with a 777-200LR. And that, that 19 and a half hours that it took the 247 to fly across the United States, you could now in 19 and a half hours fly from London to, to uh, Sydney, which was really remarkable. And it just demonstrates the continued improvement in the industry. Because, you know, as, as exciting as those 32 stops might have been on that flying boat, I mean, I'd pay, to do, I'd pay money to do that today. Um, just, it's a lot better to go home in one flight. So after that, we faced a decision. We've got a lot of technology available, and do we apply the technology for an airplane that goes faster at current levels of efficiencies? Or do we want to build an airplane that goes at current speeds, but a lot more efficiently? And so we had to weigh this competition between the Sonic Cruiser and the 780, what became the 787. And it was a real tough choice because we had a lot of really good technology that was available to us that could be used for either. And we knew, and the airlines knew as well, that to some degree people would pay for speed because it's time saved and people will pay for time saved. And the, the Sonic Cruiser cruising at 0.98 Mach had the promise of being able to take 15% off the time of a Trans-Pacific flight. And all of our data suggested that people will pay more money for that. As an example, we believe that on a flight from um, San Francisco to Tokyo, people would pay about $35 more per ticket per hour saved on the flight for an economy class passenger and about $50 more for a, for a business class passenger. And the data supported that. If you looked at how people made buying decisions about non-stop flights versus one-stop flights versus two-stop flights, it was very clear that people would pay more money um, to get there faster. And so we worked with the airlines to try to understand that. And I remember the day that we made the decision of which of the two configurations to do. We had a small room in downtown Seattle. We had probably 30 airlines there. We'd gone through all the data. They'd been with us on a, on a year and a half journey trying to figure out which airplane to do. We looked at all the data and one of the airlines stood up and said, you know, here's the thing. I can fly 777s from San Francisco to Tokyo today, and I can charge $2,000 for the ticket. My colleague can fly the Sonic Cruiser on that same flight, and he can charge $2,200 for that flight. And people will pay it. They'll pay the extra $200 for that round trip ticket because they're gonna save so much time. And so he'll put a Sonic Cruiser on the same route that I got my 777 on. And at 2,000 bucks, people are leaving my airplane to fly in his airplane but I can't have those empty seats, so I'm gonna lower my ticket price to pull them back. And at $1,800, people will come back to my airplane. 
Now, with a $400 difference between tickets, people won't justify that. The time saved won't justify a $400 difference. So my colleague with the Sonic Cruiser at $2,200 is going to have to reduce his ticket price down to $2,000. And then we'll reach parity again. And in the end, we'll have taken money out of the city pair. For more efficient service, we'll have taken money out of the city pair, which was never the intention. And as one of the airline CEOs said, you know, it comes down to this. I know how I'm going to lose money with today's airplanes. I have no idea how I'm going to lose money with the Sonic Cruiser, and the thought scares the hell out of me. And that was the day we decided to do the 787. And, and I remember it was, a, it was kind of a depressing day because so many of us wanted to do the Sonic Cruiser because it was so cool. 0.98 Mach, that was cool. And I remember one of my colleagues saying to me, you know, we could do that airplane in our sleep, talking about the 787. We could do that airplane in our sleep. Well, we did that instead of sleep for 13 years. It was a, it was a long journey. We finally flew that airplane on, on, uh, in December 2009. And that was, um, if I remember correctly, we were supposed to fly in 2007, so we were a little bit late. Um, but like I said earlier, we pushed technology in every direction because not only were we trying to save fuel, we were trying to create an airplane that was more comfortable to fly on. I mean, no kidding, you can go look at the, the papers that our physicians wrote for the Journal of the American Medical Association demonstrating the research we did to try to figure out why people feel bad on a, on a long airplane ride and what you can do in the airplane to make them feel better. More cabin pressure, more oxygen, more humidity, a, a gaseous purification system that scrubs the recirculated air of volatile organic compounds in flight, a, a motion control system that takes and dampens vertical gusts in cruise in the frequency band that causes motion sickness, bigger windows, LED lighting systems so you don't have the harsh on-off of traditional fluorescent lighting. All of these things we did, not because they saved fuel or because airlines would be able to charge more for the ticket prices or even because we could charge more for the airplane. We did it because we were trying to honor the passengers in a way that nobody had ever done before. And we were dead serious about it. And we did that while delivering 20% lower fuel burn than the airplanes it competed against. It was hard. It really was hard. But I, I think it was hard for the right reasons. It is a, it, to me, it's a very beautiful airplane. The, the composite structure allows us to do such very long, thin wings. I think the, the thinnest wings we'd ever done before this were on the B-47. And if you notice, you ever look at that airplane, it had very thin wings. And the wings were so thin, you couldn't even retract the landing gear into them which is why we had outriggers at the, out, at the inboard engines and two tandem gear inboard. That's why that airplane can't rotate at takeoff. It literally goes down the runway at an incident angle appropriate for flight. And when it goes fast enough, it lifts into the air. It's, that's how the airplane works. And this airplane had, had similar, very, very thin wings, but we figured out the landing gear part. Um, but the wing is the, the, the airplane is, the, the wing makes the airplane do what it does. It's an incredibly efficient aerodynamic uh, control. I like this picture because it's a little bit of the new and the old. I'm going to throw a couple of 787 pictures in here just because I think they're cool. And I have the, I have the stand, so uh, I'm going to show you some pictures. Uh, 787 and the B-17. And then this was another B-17 shot taken through the heads-up display on a 787 of a, B, of a B-17 right in front of us taxiing. This was on a flight, this was on a, one of our test flights out of Boeing Field and there was a B-17 taxiing right out in front of us. I also love this shot of the Spitfire flying along with the 787. And then this is two of my friends in the flight deck, and this was taken from the chase plane, the T-38 flying right next to it. I think that's a really cool shot. When you can see the guy's face uh, through the cockpit window while it's airborne, that's either really, really scary or really, really cool. And then this was the last certification flight. I'm on the left. And Mike Carricker, the chief pilot's on the right. And I'll tell you, it was such a great day because we had been through the ringer on 787 flight tests. Like I said, it was really, really hard. And the world just wanted us to fail. I mean, people just jump, they pile on and they want to watch you fail. And so it was really, really tough. And, and I remember it was on a Saturday and we flew the FAA to uh, Utah, Colorado, Montana, and back to Seattle doing our last, our last uh, certification conditions getting the last hours for um, functional and reliability testing, and then coming back to Seattle landing. 
And I remember we landed at Payne Field in Everett. We pulled the airplane in, and, uh, and I was in the jump seat right behind Mike, and the FAA pilot was in the right seat. We pulled in, and we had to wait 45 minutes for a tug to come push us into the parking spot. We were sitting there on the airplane, and nobody could say anything because it was over. After, after all that time, it was over, and, and we'd done everything. The airplane could be certified. And Mike looked at me, and he goes, he just said, wow, that was something. And I said, yep, let's never do that again. <laughs> so it was, it was quite a deal. But we did certify the airplane. And, you know, um, we went on to win the Collier Trophy in 2012, which was really cool. One of the, we were talking about this earlier with some of the folks here tonight. One of the reasons we won the Collier is because we went out and set um, two world records with the airplane at the end of 2011. Um, all of the Boeing airplanes hold the record for distance in their weight class. And the 787 at 553,000 pounds, 557,000 pounds for the, uh, for the Dash 9, 503,000 pounds for the 787-8, it falls into a weight class where we did not hold the world record for distance in that category. The A330 did. And I was really eager to go break that record. And so I went and convinced my boss that it would be a really cool idea to go set the world record and uh, fly the airplane from Seattle to Bangladesh nonstop. So uh, we went out on a, on a uh, December morning, Mike Carricker, me, and about, gosh, 11 other people. There were 13 of us on the flight. We took off out of Seattle, heading east, and we just kept flying until like there was no more east anymore. It was pretty cool. We, uh, we flew from Seattle to Dhaka, Bangladesh, and to set the distance record, halfway around wasn't far enough. We had to go north and south and north and south and north and south on the way over there to build up the distance. It was 10,337 nautical miles that we flew, and we beat the record by uh, over 1,200 nautical miles when we landed in Dhaka, Bangladesh at 20 hours and about 20 minutes on the flight over there. We refueled in an hour and 53 minutes, and we toured about 500 people through the airplane while we were refueling it on the ground in Dhaka. Um, we got everybody off the airplane. We took off and kept going east another 20 hours and 50 minute, 15 minutes back to Seattle for a total time, including the time on the ground, of just over 42 hours. And that, that entire, those two flights and the time on the ground set the world record for time around the Earth eastbound. And it was really, really cool. So when people say, man, I was on a really long airplane ride, it was like, God, it was like 12 hours. Now, you know, um, the Model 247 that I showed earlier, when that airplane flew, it was faster than the fastest fighter, fighter airplanes at the time. And yet the airplane was so controllable, you could fly it at 60 miles per hour safely. The 787, you know, you think about that Sonic Cruiser, it was supposed to cruise at 0.98 Mach. We actually had the 787 at 0.987 Mach in flight test once. That was sporty. We also had it in 78 knots in controlled flight. Can you imagine an airplane like that at 78 knots in controlled flight? It's just incredible. So if any of you have any pull at pen folds, please uh, give, me a, give me a call because I have a great idea. <laughs> I talked about fuel and burn, burn improvements over time. This gives you a, a graphical visual representation of the uh, in the decrease in block fuel per seat over time. And it, it is dramatic and we always continue to try to improve the products. The max that's going into service shortly has 8% has, um, better fuel efficiency than the A320, 14% better than the NG, the 737 NG. The 777X is 12% more fuel efficient than its competition and significantly more fuel efficient than the 777s that it replaces. Um, we, we do this by taking technology, tech, new technology, technology that existed, marrying it together and figuring out what's the best integrated airplane when we're done. And that's something that we always do over and over again. We have a great program um, called the Eco Demonstrator aircraft program that my team runs in Seattle where we pick an airplane, we set a date, and then we figure out what technologies we can mature to demonstrate on that airplane on that date. So far, we've had a 737 Eco Demonstrator in 2012. We had a 787 Eco Demonstrator. We had a 757, which is pictured here. And we're currently flying in partnership with Embraer, an Embraer 170 Eco Demonstrator in Brazil. But it's been a great way to pick an airplane, drive technologies to the airplane, demonstrate those technologies in a flight environment, and mature them so that they can be used by an airplane program later on. And that's the kind of thing that we're gonna, we're gonna keep on doing. It's been 100 years, 
a hundred years of innovation, and you know, you, you, I, I mentioned this concept of standing on the shoulders of giants, and, and it's really true. Um, I think back, and who would have ever imagined a hundred years ago that we would be where we are today? It's just, it's just really amazing to think about. Um, the people, the men, the women that came before us, the, the safe and efficient airplanes that we fly today are really a testament to the men and women that came before us and to their vision and to their courage. And it's really amazing to me when I think about it. And, you know, while we're trying to deliver the 777X and while we're trying to deliver the MAX, in the back rooms of Boeing right now, there's people quietly working in product development in the same way they have for 100 years on what, what the next thing is. And they're working on lots of stuff. And some of it may never, most of it will never see the light of day. Um, some of it will, maybe a couple of them will see a little bit of light like the hunchback of Muckle Teo did or like the Sonic Cruiser did, and maybe one of them will become the next great airplane. But, but it almost doesn't matter, because to me it's all about the tradition and how it all, it's all stitched together. For 100 years, it's all been stitched together. Generation after generation, giant after giant, it's all stitched together. And we've got, I mean, engineers and pilots with the courage of their conviction. We've got financiers and executives with the courage to bet the company again and again. We've got mechanics in the factory with the brains and the strength and the skill to figure out a way to do it over and over again when times it looks like it's impossible. Our, our, our airplanes, th this progress is really, a, like I said, it's a testament to the, the will of these people over all these years. And you know, if I were Bill Boeing 100 years ago, I don't think I ever could have imagined what the next hundred years would bring. And standing here today, I can't imagine what the next hundred years would bring. I can't wait to start figuring it out, but I can't imagine it. 